It's a great night. It's so nice to see familiar faces and make new friends tonight. It's great to meet you all. I have one hope tonight, and that is I want to impart valuable information to protect your spine, your brain, and your mind so that you can live a longer, happier, healthier, more exhilarating life. You heard my professional introduction. This is my personal bio. Medicine is in my DNA. The picture up in the upper right hand corner, left hand corner, is my grandfather, my great uncle, and my two uncles. And my nephew, a fourth generation physician, is training at Drexel now. I am lucky to be a part of a very special group of doctors who are outstanding surgeons, people who would take care of my wife and my family like you wouldn't believe. They're phenomenal surgeons and phenomenal doctors and people. As you know, I'm a coach. I love coaching my wrestlers in the wrestling room, my staff in the office, and my team in the operating room. I love helping people unlock their potential. And lastly, this is a picture of my grandfather's prescription pad. I keep it with me every day. He's with me with every patient that I see. And I have to tell you, I love being a doctor. I love being a neurosurgeon. And the most favorite thing, the thing I love the most, is when a patient comes into my office, puts their arms around me and gives me a big hug and says, Doc, thanks for saving my life. It is priceless and it is precious and I love it. You know what I hate about neurosurgery? It's not the long hours, it's not the stress, it's not waking up with a pounding headache the next morning because you've been peering through a microscope all day. It's delivering bad news. Bad news about preventable, avoidable traumas, tragedies, and diseases. I'm going to be showing you some pictures tonight of autopsy specimens. People who have died from preventable diseases, preventable traumas. These specimens that you're going to see here were living, breathing people, just like you and I. And unfortunately, they succumbed to mishaps or diseases that are preventable and avoidable. So I show you these pictures not to repulse you or to make a strong impression on you, but really to honor these people. Let's honor them by preventing these accidents from happening in our lives, in our family, and our friends. Now I know you heard my bio, but tonight I don't want you to think of me as Dr. McLaughlin. I want you to think of me as Mark, your trail guide. And I even brought my backpack for our hike. I view learning as a journey. And some of the best conversations and lessons I've ever been able to teach my kids is on hiking trails. So let's go on a journey tonight. In my backpack, I have packed three books for our journey. The Power of Habit, Save Your Aching Back and Neck, and The Noticer. Each one of these books contains valuable lessons that I'm going to share with you that will help you protect your spine, brain, and mind. Let's get started. The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg. It's a wonderful read. It's about why habits are created, why they exist, and how we can change them. See, it's very interesting. You know, 40 to 50 percent of the things that we do on a daily basis are not decisions. They're actually automatic habits. Our brain tries to find a shortcut. It wants to conserve energy. So what does it do? It creates a loop in our brain that allows us to not have to make a decision. So what is the anatomy of a habit? A habit is formed by a simple loop, a cue, a routine, and a reward. And it's fed by cravings. So if you have a craving for a runner's high and you put your shoes on, you're going to go for a run and you're going to feel that runner's high, you're going to feel that reward, and that's going to feel good. And that's going to feed that loop. And that's a wonderful habit to have. But what if our habit is we're experiencing stress and we reach for some food 
or we reach for a glass of alcohol or something else. And then we get our reward, which is to relax ourselves. That's a bad habit. These bad habits need to be modified or deleted from our activity. This is an excellent book that talks about this habit loop. So what does that have to do with safety of our spine? I want to train you to be tragedy terminators. I want to train your eyes and your mind tonight to seek out and find danger in your home and in your family and your friends' homes. Because I can tell you, I see people in our emergency room every day that don't need to be there. Hold on to the banister. Clear stairs of any kind of clutter. These kinds of shoes are dangerous shoes. They should not be in your wardrobe when you turn 50, 60, 70. They need to be eliminated. Throw rugs need to be removed. Keep your eyes out for throw rugs. Standing stools in the kitchens. Everything should be on eye level from now on. Everything should be on eye level. No standing stools. The changing light bulb days are over. You've got to get somebody to do that for you. Protect yourself. These falls are avoidable. Light your hallways. These night lights are cheap. You can get 20 of a, a pack of 20 at Costco. They're highly worthwhile. And most importantly, and I want you to remember this, when you get up out of bed, think of the three S's. Sit, stabilize, and stand. When you sit there, I want you to sit there and stabilize yourself for 60 seconds before you stand. Most falls happen when people get right out of bed. Remember when you were a kid? You just got right out of bed and ran out to go play in the yard. We can't do that anymore. We have to sit, stabilize, and stand. So I'm hoping that you guys are going to hear this wrestling coach in your ear when you wake up in the morning tomorrow. Sit, stabilize, stand. Sit, stabilize, stand. So the first lesson is first we make our habits, and then our habits make us. So what habits are you going to make? The second book and the second lesson is, in order to save your aching back and neck, you must first understand it, and then you can protect it and nourish it. This is a wonderful book written by a friend of mine down in Boca Raton, Stuart Idelson. And it's basically a manual for your spine. And we're going to talk about our spine and our brain. But it's funny, you know, we look at the car manual, we know how the car works, but we don't know how our brain works. This is a manual for your brain and spine. So first we'll talk about our spine. The spine is composed of 31 bones stacked upon each other like a skyscraper. And between each bone is a shock absorber called a disc. And those discs allow us to bend, twist, and turn. The spine's function is for structural support to hold us up and it also protects the spinal cord that's where the spinal cord sits, housed by bone all the way around it. It's a suit of armor to protect your spinal cord. Around those bones, holding those bones together, are ligaments and muscles. And let me tell you, we need to get those ligaments and muscles strong. We need to work on our core musculature early. That holds our spine together, that keeps our posture, and that keeps you upright longer and healthier. On your left is a healthy spine. Okay, you can see bones here. These are the stacks of bones. Here are the discs. They're nice and plump and full. You can see the balance of the muscles on the sides here. And I like to think of the spine almost like as a circus tent with all the tarps and the ties and the stakes holding that tent down firmly so it's functioning properly. But if one of those stakes comes out or one of those wires gets frayed the, and pulls, the tent is now has a wrinkle in it. It has an imbalance. And just like a tire that's off balance, it's running on mile and mile and mile and wearing out. It's the same thing with your spine. The more you can keep these muscles healthy and balanced, the better you're going to be, the longer your spine is going to function normally. Here on the right, you can see that there's a degenerated disc, <coughs> severely dehydrated disc, bone spurs forming, the trabeculated honeycombed area of the bone is worn down and collapsed. And you can see the bone spurs that are forming. They can push on nerves and blood vessels. This is a worn out, unbalanced spine. Here's a side view of a spine. Again, this is a healthy spine. Nice stacked, honeycombed bone with a nice plump disc in it. It's protecting the spinal cord, which sits right here. There's room in front of and behind the spinal cord. 
Here's an unhealthy spine, worn down disc, bone spur here, narrowing of the spinal canal, compression of the spinal canal, worn out, unbalanced spine. So what can we do? We can keep flexible and strong. We can do this with basic, simple exercises, joint exercises, neck rolls. Keep yourself limber. Very simple exercises to keep your spine loose and balanced. Another thing we can do is we can keep our bones strong. This is a picture of an osteoporotic compression fracture. One of the blocks of bone has collapsed and it's causing severe pain. And what we need to do for this person is we need to put a needle in and inject a, a glue which fills that fracture and solidifies it almost like a caulking in the bone. But if you exercise, you strengthen your bones. Bone is like a tissue. It's like your skin. And if you exercise it, it remains stronger and healthier. So it's important for you, if you think of like astronauts, they get osteoporosis because gravity is a great stress for our bones. So if you stress your bones, they're going to be stronger and they're less likely to collapse or fail on you. Good posture and ergonomics are very important. Throwing your shoulders back, putting your spine in alignment. Remember, you got a 10-pound bowling ball on top of your spine that you need to balance. The more you throw your shoulders back and relax yourself, the better balance you have. I always try and tell my patients, remember, if you ever moved something on a dolly, if you balance that dolly perfectly with your and it's right in balance, you can hold it with two fingers. But if that dolly is leaning forward and you have a heavy object, you've got to work hard. If your head and your shoulders are forward, all of your muscles in your back are working overtime to hold you up. That's why you have aching back and neck pain at the end of the day. Balance. Throw your shoulders back. Throw your pelvis out. Keep your shoulders proud. When you're working on the computer, put books under your computer screen to get it up to eye level. Just like we're in the operating room, Tatiana and Joanna, they know. I sit down in my chair and I sit like this and I have everybody bring the table and the microscope to where I'm at so that I can work for long periods of time without having pain. This is a great holiday gift. Maybe a gift certificate to relax the back or another uh, company that has ergonomic chairs or ergonomic pillows. And remember, one size doesn't fit all. You need a pillow that's going to keep your head in a neutral position when you're resting. So these are the kinds of things that can balance your spine out and avoid crinking uh, the neck and, and compressing nerves. So we talked about the spine and how we pr can protect it. Let's talk a little bit about the brain. So a little anatomy lesson here. Remember the brain has multiple lobes and each lobe has a function. So highly simplified, let's take you through it. We have the frontal lobe here. The frontal lobe is our planning lobe and our voluntary action lobe. This is the part of the brain that I wish my 18-year-old son would develop a little bit more. <laughs> Parietal lobe, that's where we navigate. That's where we have a sense of space and time. That we lose a little bit of that as we get older, where our feet are and our hands are in space and time. Occipital lobe is our vision. Temporal lobe memory, and our cerebellum is our coordination center, and down here is our brainstem, which is automatic function, breathing, consciousness, blood pressure, respirations, all of those sorts of things. And the gray matter sits on the top of the brain. The gray matter is like your thinking cap, okay? It's on the outside of the brain, and then on the inside of the brain is the white matter. The white matter is like your connectivity. It's your Verizon network. It connects all of these cells together. So the white matter and the gray matter communicate with each other so, as, so we can think, act, and do everything. So let's do a little exercise now. This is your, your gray matter and your white matter working together. Everybody, read these colors. Ready? Go. Okay, now pay attention. Name these colors. Name the colors. Purple, orange, green, red, blue, black. Throws you off. This is the orchestra that your brain is conducting at all times. It's got to relate between each other. This is an anatomical brain, an anatomical specimen right here. 
Again, frontal lobe, parietal lobe, occipital lobe, cerebellum, brainstem, automatic function, cerebellum, coordination, occipital lobe, vision, parietal, navigation, space and time, frontal lobe, planning, and voluntary motion. Take a gander at this. This is the most complex hard drive in the universe. 100 billion cells, 100 trillion synapses. I love this picture. I could look at it all day long. In fact, I do. It's protected by an outer wrapper called our scalp and then a hard helmet called the skull. And then inside there's a layer and a, like a fluid that's called cerebrospinal fluid. It's like a Dr. Scholl's jelly. It protects your brain from trauma. So if you have a blow to your head, the, that blow is dampened by the cerebrospinal fluid that's inside your head. So this area right here is where the fluid sits and it'll, it protects our brain. What happens when we have a concussion? Okay, What happens is we have a disruption of the white matter connections with the gray matter. You lose your Verizon network. This is a concussed patient. This is a normal patient. You can see the connections within the white matter are lost. It's like having one bar or half a bar on your phone. The words aren't getting through. You can't communicate. You're getting dropped calls. That's exactly what happens in thinking when you're trying to think when you've had a concussion. These are the kinds of things we need to pay attention to. These are, this is a malfunctioning brain. Maybe in our grandchild that just had a concussion or a mild head bump at the football game and now he's going to climb into a car. We got to know about this stuff. We got to protect people from this. You, you may not be able to make the decision that you need to. What happens if the, con if the concussions are multiple, multiple repetitive injuries? This is very interesting for you history buffs. This is Harrison Martland, who was a pathologist that my grandfather taught me about when I was a kid. He was a Newark pathologist, and he began doing autopsies, and he started noticing that boxers had early dementia. And he was the first person who coined the term punch drunk. He described it in the 1920s. We knew about chronic traumatic encephalopathy in boxers in the 1920s. Here is a brain with chronic traumatic encephalopathy. That is a boxer's or a severe in head in multiple repetitive injuries from a football player. You can see a normal brain here. You can see the, the gray matter this on the surface, the thinking cap. The white matter here is, is very healthy. And look down here, how you can see how that white matter has shrunk. You can see how the fluid pockets are enlarged. There's a lot of atrophy in this brain. This brain is shrunken like a walnut. And then you can see on the microscopic images, you can see these abnormal neurofibrillary tangles. They're little cells that have died within the brain that we see microscopically, typical with people that have chronic traumatic encephalopathy. So this is one trauma, an avoidable trauma that we need to know about in football players and boxers. What else? What other avoidable traumas do we have? Well, remember we talked about that little Dr. Scholl's cushion, the cerebrospinal fluid, that space that cushions blows. Unfortunately, sometimes as we get older and our brain shrinks, that space can be an area where bleeding occurs. So now I'm going to move to a couple of autopsy specimens. And again, as I said, I'm showing you this because these are avoidable, preventable problems. The figure on the left is a large blood clot that's inside the skull on the outside surface of the brain. This is called an epidural hematoma. This person fell on a ski slope. They didn't have a helmet on. Preventable, avoidable. Helmets are critical to protect our brain in any activity where you're moving. Sledding, skiing, anything where you have velocity, you need a helmet and you need a proper fitting helmet. So it's best not to buy your grandkids a helmet. It's best to get them fitted properly at a store, get a gift certificate or something so they get a properly fitting helmet. And it needs to change every year because kids' si head sizes grow. On the other side, this is a subdural hematoma. This is a person who tripped on something on their steps, a small toy. They fell down and they had a severe blood clot on the brain. Preventable, avoidable. This is a brain abscess. This person had a tooth abscess. 
and uh, they didn't take care of it. They didn't like to go to the dentist, and they, the bacteria in their mouth got into their bloodstream. They went from their heart to their brain, and it lodged in their brain, and abscesses or infections of the brain cause very, they're very irritating, and they can cause seizures. And this person had seizures, uncontrolled seizures, and they died of their seizures. All they need to do is have good oral hygiene. Very important. Here's a person. You can see this is, a, this is a specimen. You don't see the wrinkles of the brain that you normally see. Why? Because this is all pus on the surface of the brain. This is pneumococcal men, uh, pneumonia, pneumococcal meningitis that came from pneumococcal men, pneumonia. So a simple vaccine could have prevented this brain infection. The figure you see here is a blood clot. This is a hypertensive bleed in the brain that was caused by uncontrolled high blood pressure. So think of the blood vessels in your brain like the pipes in your house. If there's a surge in pressure, the pipes freeze and they break because there's increased pressure in the pipes. You get water all over the house. If your pipes break in your brain, you get a lethal blood clot. This is a controlled, uh, this is something to be controlled with antihypertensive medications. This is a person who passed away from another kind of a stroke. This is a stroke, you notice how it's like a wedge. Remember, blood vessels feed the brain like a tributary of a river. And if they clog, all the brain tissue outside that tributary will, pat, will die. This person had un, high uh, cholesterol and uncontrolled diabetes. Again, medications could have present, pre prevented this problem from happening. This is a person with chronic alcoholism. This is a healthy cerebellum, and this is a person with chronic alcoholism. You can see the cerebellum, which is the coordination center of your brain, allows you for balance and voluntary movement. This is shrunken. You can see space in these crevices here. Alcohol in high quantities is a neurotoxin. It kills brain cells. Alcohol in moderation may actually have some protective effects, and we'll talk about that in, in a moment. I think everybody's here tonight to really talk about and learn how we can prevent or minimize the chances of Alzheimer's disease, which is a devastating disease. One thing we can do, we know that excessive trans and saturated fats can lead to the deposition of beta amyloid, which is the protein that lodges in the brain in in uh, Alzheimer's disease. So these types of foods need to be avoided. This is a microscopic view of someone with Alzheimer's disease and you can see this is the, the tangle of protein called beta amyloid and this is the neurofibrillary tangle. This is a dead neuron. So unfortunately Alzheimer's disease not only affects the gray matter, the neuronal cells, it also affects the white matter with these protein deposits. So avoiding trans and fatty acids can certainly be one thing that we can do to help minimize the chances of having Alzheimer's disease. What else can we do? It's been shown, studies have shown that the Mediterranean diet tends to have a better effect on our brain function and our cardiovascular health. These are diets high in fruits, nuts, vegetables, legumes, fish more than meat. Very important. Uh, and healthy diet. Water is by far your best liquid nutrient. Buyer beware. We are our children, our grandchildren, and we are being bombarded with companies that are trying to package unhealthy products for you and me. Look at the amount of sugar in these products. Your brain and spine needs water. Your body is 70% water. Your joints need lubrication. Your cerebrospinal fluid is made of water. Your body needs water. Drink water. It's your best nutrient. Eight to 10 cups a day. Helps your kidneys. What about supplements? Well, supplements, some very specific supplements can be helpful. Vitamin E, one must be careful about, and you need to have a doctor monitoring vitamin E. Some vitamin E, particularly vitamin E in the source of natural foods like nuts and, uh, and leafy green vegetables is healthy, about 15 grams a day. 
Supplements on a daily basis can actually are associated with heart disease and cancer. So you gotta be careful with this. We don't know why, but too much vitamin E is bad. A little bit of vitamin E is helpful. B complex uh, is restorative for neuronal function. It's known to uh, repair nerve cells. Nicotinamide, niagen, is a fuel for the mitochondria of the cell. Mitochondria are the powerhouse of the cell. That's where the energy comes from. Vitamin D3 and omega fish oils, omega-3 fish oils, these are antioxidants. We know that oxidative stress is one of the causes of Alzheimer's disease. What is oxidative stress? It's like rust inside your brain. So how can we prevent rust from occurring in our brain? We can attack free radicals with these antioxidants, which will take these radicals and prevent them from damaging our brain tissue. Folate is also very helpful, particularly in ch uh, women of childbearing age. It helps the development of the spinal canal. What else can we add to our diet? Berries, blueberries, raspberries, strawberries uh, have resveratrol in it, these flavonoids. One glass of red wine for women, two glasses of red wine for men are shown to be helpful and, uh, in minimizing cardiovascular disease and possibly in good brain health as well. They, ha they contain a compound called resveratrol, which is an anti-inflammatory. It inhibits the inflammation that occurs with brain degeneration. What about exercise? We talked about exercise to strengthen your bones. This is a very interesting study that was done at the University of Illinois. This is your brain after 20 minutes of brisk walking. This is the EEG brainwave activity. Look at that. We know that exercise, and not even strenuous exercise, just moderate exercise increases something called brain-derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF. It's a, it's a protein that's in your brain, and it's like fertilizer for your brain. And we know that exercise increases BDNF. So exercise will awaken neural pathways. And think about it. After a workout, aren't you thinking more clearly? Isn't your vision clear? Don't your joints feel better? Your body has actually delivered itself fertilizer for the brain and endorphins, which relax and uh, relieve pain. So it's also very important to have good sleep habits. It's, it's thought that sleep is... The brain is just as active in sleep as it is when we're awake. But in sleep, the brain seems to be pruning memories that are not necessary. It seems to be erasing pathways that are not important and thus allowing other pathways, things that we've learned that are important, to stick better. So six to eight hours of sleep, very important. Relaxation, also very important. Some type of stress management. And lastly, some type of brain exercises, cognitive exercises crossword puzzles, Sudoku, memorizing a stanza of a poem, reading a book, those sorts of things we know keep the brain active and reinforce neural function. It's interesting, um, there's a book that I'm gonna recommend to you uh, called The Blue Zones, and it's written by a gentleman by the name of Dan Butner, who was a National Geographic editor uh, and, pho and photographer. And what he did was he studied areas of the world where longevity was prevalent. And he found five places on Earth where you're 10 times more likely to live to 100. And he looked at the factors of what was going on in these societies. And what he found was nine items. And some of the stuff we've talked about today. These people were able to manage stress better. They had a purpose in their life. The elderly in these people's societies, they were not relegated to the outskirts of town. They were a part of the family. They were sought out for advice when important decisions were made. They had a, they had a, a diet, a Mediterranean type diet. They drank alcohol in moderation, but they drank it socially. They had it with friends and family regularly. They had another uh, hobby, which is particularly in Okinawa, which is called harahashi bu, which is pushing your plate away after you're 80% full. And that seems to be uh, uh, your satiety center catching up with your, with your hunger. So if you can push that food away when you're 80% full, in five minutes you're likely going to feel full. They set up their life to have movement. They, they were not vigorous exercisers, but they rode bikes to work or they walked to work or they went to the market by, on foot 
they manage to find a way to have activity in every part of their life. They associated themselves with people who were positive, and they, many of them belonged to a religion and attended re uh, religious services four times a month. In fact, that one statistic increases your chances of getting to 100 by four to 10 times, interestingly enough. Okay, so we talked about protecting and nourishing our spine. We've talked about protecting and nourishing our brain. Let's talk a little bit about nourishing our mind. And that leads me to the third book, The Noticer by Andy Andrews. This is one of my favorite books. And the lesson from this book is, if you're still here, the most important part of your life is yet to come. And what he says in a dialogue with one of the characters is, he says, take a big deep breath. Why doesn't everybody do that right now? Take a big breath. What is that proof of? Alive. We're alive. <laughs> and if we're alive, our purpose on earth has not yet been complete. And if our purpose in life has not yet been completed, then the most important part of our life has yet to come. Who knows what one small act of kindness, who knows what one lesson to one young person passed on generation to generation to generation, who knows what kind of a chain reaction that could cause? And he points out a man by the name of Norman Borlaug. Does anybody know who Norman Borlaug is? I get this at most of my talks. Norman Borlaug. Well, I'll tell you because I'm a wrestling coach. If I ever ask you about anybody on earth, if you say the guy was a wrestler, you're probably going to be 80% of the time right. Norman Borlaug was a, a wrestler at the University of Minnesota, but that wasn't what made him fam famous. What made him famous was he saved two billion lives. Two billion lives. He won the Nobel Prize. He invented a dwarf wheat genetic strain that's disease and famine resistant. And it's grown all over the world. And it's been projected that he saved two billion lives. So, and a, a huge impact on this world, right? But was it Norman Borlaug, or was it Henry Wallace, who was the Vice President of the United States, who appropriated the funds for Norman Borlaug to do the research? Henry Wallace knew about botany, and he knew its power over, its, over ge geopolitical and geographic spaces and what botany could do. And he had a love of botany. So maybe it wasn't Norman Borlaug, Maybe it was Henry Wallace, the Vice President of the United States, right? Or maybe it was the 19-year-old Iowa State student who taught Henry Wallace the love of botany when he was a six-year-old kid. You know who that 19-year-old young man was? George Washington Carver. George Washington Carver was a student at Iowa State and his, his professor was Henry Wallace's dad. And Henry Wallace's dad would let his six-year-old son go for nature walks with George Washington Carver. George Washington Carver instilled the love of botany into Henry Wallace. So maybe it was George Washington Carver who saved two billion lives, right? Well, did you know that George Washington Carver almost died as an infant? He was kidnapped by raiders? And the farmer in Missouri chased the raiders down three days, gave away his prize horse, and saved, wasn't able to save George Washington Carver's mom, but saved George Washington Carver as an infant and took him back to his home and raised him. So maybe it was the farmer who saved those two billion lives. The point of this is that you never know what one act you do what, it will, what effect it will have on somebody in the future. And that's what I love about this book. So, the most important part of your life is yet to come. What about Tim and Nina? In their mid-50s, they were a, a corporate attorneys in New York City. They had a love for food. And they started raiding restaurants. 
And all of a sudden, it became a real passion for them. And they ultimately sold their rating system called Zagat, which I think you've all heard of, for $150 million to Google. Not a bad, not a bad idea when they were 50. How about Ron and Nancy Reagan? Ron Reagan started public office in 1955. He was sworn in, in ninth, when, he was, when he was 69 years old. One of our most powerful and influential presidents. I'm not just talking about rich and famous people. This is Olive. She lives in a very rural area in Canada. And she realized that elderly people in Canada were being taken advantage of with fraud and scams. And she decided to start doing a research project on it. She went back to school, got her master's, and now she's getting her PhD in cyber fraud. And she's reporting to the Canadian government and giving recommendations on how to help people and prevent this from happening. And I have to talk to you about my mom and dad. My dad is 88. My mom's 85. They formed the World War II book club in New Jersey. My dad has written two books in his 80s. I brought them here to show you. He's a military historian. This one's out. This one's coming out soon. And good luck getting in touch with them. I can't reach them any day. They're busy every single day out giving lectures talking, reading, they're, 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 this is the World War II mem uh, War Memorial. You never know what you can do. So, first you make your habits, and then your habits make you. In order to save your neck and back and brain, you must first understand it, and then you can protect and nourish it. And lastly, the most important part of your life is yet to come. We're almost done here. I'd like to get a show of hands. Can anybody raise their hand if they've learned something new today? Good. How many of you are excited about sharing this information with your family and friends? Good. I want to ask you in the next 24 hours, share this information. Get people thinking about protecting their family and friends from from hazards in the house. Talk to them about their purpose. See, my feeling is this. You don't have to be in the army to be on a mission. And you don't have to be in the military to be of service. You don't have to be in an operating room to save a life. You don't have to be in a police car to protect a life. And you don't have to be in a fire truck to rescue a life. Knowledge can do all of the above. If you're armed with the right knowledge, you can go out and protect your brain, spine, and your mind, and you can pass it on. You can unlock your potential, and you can live your best life possible. Longer, healthier, more meaningful, more exhilarating life. I view my life in the future as still. Not still as in not moving. Still as in still curious still learning, still discovering, still doing, and still enjoying. I hope that you leave this room with a new perspective on life, and I wish you the best of luck. Thank you for your time. My gift to you is a handout which outlines some of the lessons and pearls that we talked about today. So. I'll, uh, I'll give this, uh, we'll have this at the, at the door when you leave. Thank you.